All right, it's six o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to the uh, quarterly NASW Pennsylvania Chapter Town Hall meeting, uh, which is a great opportunity for members and non-members, uh, but uh, social workers in general in Pennsylvania to um, get a little bit of CE credit while also learning about um, important events and having the opportunity to like talk things through, ask questions, et cetera. Thrilled to be here and um, I'll introduce our speakers starting with um, that this is the first town hall meeting for our new president, <laughs> Sierra McNeil. Congratulations. Thank you, thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, nice to be in our first town hall as officially your president. Um, I'm excited about this town hall because we'll have a lot of great uh, updates um, about the budget as well as the conference. And so I'm excited that all of you are spending your Tuesday? Tuesday evening? Yes, Tuesday. My days are already mixed up. This is the Mondayest Tuesday it has ever been. <laughs> um, so glad that you all can make it tonight. All right, and um, next I'm going to introduce um, from our lobbying team, uh, Angie Armbrust. Hi, everyone. Glad to be joining you tonight. And also um, Natalie Cook. I know you were maybe joining from your car, but <laughs> I saw your name. I am. <laughs> I am. I'm in the car. I apologize. Um, but I am here. Thank you. If I can get my video working, I will uh, hop on video. Oh, no problem. No problem. Um, thank you for joining us. Angie and Natalie have been our, uh, have, they're, they're with um, McNee, Wallace and Nurek as the lobbying firm and have been NASWPA lobbyists for, I'm thinking, four or five years. <laughs> Four or five years, somewhere around there. Yeah, <laughs> somewhere in there. So we're really glad to have them on our on our team. Um, and then finally, I want to introduce our special guest, um, social worker, MSW, and now member of the Shapiro administration, uh, Annette Nance. Good evening, everyone. Happy to be with you all and excited to be in conversation and, and learn about all the different things going on as well as I'll, what I'll share. Um, now, Annette, I was going to actually start off with, with you and ask you if you could share a little bit more about your position in the Shapiro administration and um, how, you, how you ended up there. Yeah, so um, I do have a little presentation, if that will help to kind of like, if folks are visual, so I sure. can share my screen. Um, real quick so that you will be able to see that. Uh, all right. So, all right. Well, probably, can everyone see my screen? Good. Yeah. Okay. So I'll go through it though, because it is a bit of a bit wordy, but I wanted to, folks to just kind of get the vision and then I can email it to you as well so that you'll have it to like go through. There's some things you probably may already mention. Um, so a uh, picture of myself. I'm the executive director of the Governor's Advisory Commission on African American Affairs. I'm a government affairs professional. I also have my MSW from the University of Pittsburgh. Um, my undergrad is in psychology. I've worked in the nonprofit space. Space, also in higher education. Um, and also, I am a former elected official on the local level. I was on my borough council, and I was also in the Marine Corps active duty, active duty for about eight years. Um, I was a part of Operation Enduring Freedom in the Middle East around 2013 timeframe <laughs> as well. Um, so yeah, like like I said, it's wordy, but I once you read through it, you'll get the picture. Um, but in short, the advisory commission is made up of 30 volunteer members that are appointed by Governor Josh Shapiro and really help to advise on things related to programs, policy, and legislation that are benefiting um, African Americans in the Commonwealth. Um, so the biggest thing I um, also wanted to know, I will interchange African American and Black, um, but uh, interchanging those words so that you'll see that throughout the slide and just when I'm talking as well. Um, there are a lot of different ways that um, the commissioners advise and they're throughout the um, 
they're throughout the Commonwealth. So it's not just Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. We have some commissioners in Erie, Pike County, uh, Monroe, uh, Montgomery. So it's, it's all over the Commonwealth. Um, and like I said, they're appointed by um, the governor. And then our honorary chair is Second Lady Blair Holmes Davis. Um, so this is kind of the responsibilities that the commissioners have. Wanted to kind of show you this excerpt of just the things that they are doing, reviewing and recommending policies. So it does require a lot of reading. So it's almost like you're in grad school all over again, but it is very, it's for a great cause, reading over policies and under making sure that uh, the language is inclusive, the information um, is relatable to the community that is serving. Um, also, another thing is there are five other commissions. So that's women, AAPI, Latino, LGBTQ, and um, uh, Next Gen, which is the newest one. Um, and that one is more geared to that 16 to 26 age range. So I always try to talk about the other commissions as well um, when I'm presenting or talking to other folks. Um, kind of about what we do and is really being in the community and advocating um, for different causes and things like that. So we have subcommittees um, within our commission, um, education, workforce development, and gun violence. Um, so the commissioners, the commission was reinstated in June uh, with an executive order. So all of them have an executive order that re, re um, establishes them under this new administration. Um, two of the most uh, public events that we have uh, the Black History Month event, which was at the governor's residence. Um, I was not the executive director at the time. The, the, uh, that position was uh, being filled, so we were interviewing. And then the Juneteenth recognition event, um, that was at the State Museum. I was the executive director then, and I led that event. And we had some beautiful um, pieces, which I'll show on a couple of other slides, wanting to be mindful of your time. But this is kind of some of the um, events. So Black Maternal Health, um, we were there in attendance with Second Lady Blair, who spoke, and a couple of other advocates um, throughout the Commonwealth. So as you see, Rep Curry also spoke, and a couple of other folks um, about Black maternal health, the specifics, the research, and also if, if folks are not aware, there was legislation passed around maternal health that was championed by uh, Rep. Cephas uh, out of Philadelphia and a couple of others, um, but it was passed around the time that there was the budget impasse, um, and so that was uh, when at least two other uh, things of legislation were passed as well to really make sure that holding folks accountable when it comes to reporting about uh, maternal morbidity and things of that nature. Um, so these are some of the photos from the Juneteenth event. We were able to partner with the PA Council of Arts folks and provide an honorarium to artists. So we had about seven artists from around the Commonwealth that were able to participate, have their art throughout the museum. Uh, wish I would have had more photos, but you kind of get the picture. So we had them across the museum. And so folks were able to kind of walk through, the governor himself also walked through and um, an amazing opportunity came out of this for one of our artists, a couple actually. Um, one has their art featured in the governor's residence. So we're, it was really awesome that that opportunity came out of it and others were able to get some pieces of art. Um, and so this was a great event. We had um, a lot of transformational and amazing leaders from around the Commonwealth who were at this event. Um, a few highlights from the First Lady's office. Um, you probably have seen some of this stuff throughout um, social media or the website or you know things like that of the spaces that she's joined, um, State Police Academy and things of that nature. Um, but like I said, I know if, it might sound like I'm going through this fast, but I will email this so that you can kind of go through yourself since I know we have a good bit of other speakers. Um, and then also the first bill that was passed really, um, really important, especially as it relates to breast cancer screenings being free for Pennsylvanians. Um, it's crazy to think that we are just now at this point, but also knowing that this is still an amazing feat within the Shapiro Davis administration and also how we are moving things um, forward compared to a lot of other states. Um, so let's see, a couple of the same things here of things that were created if folks were aware or who per, um, who work with those that do abortion care. So the website is available for folks to be able to find abortion care within Pennsylvania. 
And so that was something that did not exist prior. Um, and so that came out of um, the uh, items that happened with the, uh, the, the SCOTUS ruling. So you'll see that there. I have, I'll have more um, things that you can read on it there just for you to be aware of. Um, and then touch a little bit about the Lieutenant Governor and the things that he's been doing as he is leading the Board of Pardons. Um, there was a, a grant opportunity that came out of um, PCCD, so the um, uh, First Chance Scholarship Fund that was to school districts and community-based organizations. And so a lot of monies of that was related to the Safer Communities tour that he did that he kicked off in Pittsburgh and went throughout the Commonwealth. Um, so just highlighting a couple of those things. You'll read about that there. And this was also related to gun violence prevention. Pictured here are some folks who are advocates and also uh, doing this work. Um, this was held in Philadelphia, but there's also a couple of bullet points there. Uh, let's see. I just put the, the definition of budget impasse. I don't wanna assume that everyone is familiar with government affairs lingo and things like that, especially since there was a huge delay. Um, I think that we're all learning together. I've come across a lot of social workers who um, are not as familiar with things in the government relations space. So I try to give definition and also something, another thing that is interesting to note, um, when they say the government, the, the budget is passed, it doesn't always mean that it is done because there's so many other administrative things that need to be done. Um, so when the, the budget was actually signed August 3rd, there were so many things that it delayed. So for example, not many people know that when the budget is delayed, um, a lot of folks like myself and others who travel throughout the state, um, the any travel that we are doing is not be reimbursed right away like usual. And then also it hinders like school districts trying to under, um, dissect their funding and where things will go there. Um, and, uh, and, and that's like pretty huge when we think about it was literally August 3rd, we are in what's today's the 29th school started for some um, districts either this week or last week. So it's still, you know, it, um, provided such a hindrance in a lot of different ways. Um, and so there was a couple of things within like the mental health space, maternal health, I'm sure uh, Angie would probably cover some of these items, but just showing you some of the stuff that the administration has worked on. And then prior to that, when uh, the governor was attorney general, safe to say um, that was uh, one of the initiatives and programs that were launched. I have the link in there as well so that you can check that out for um, yourselves. Let's see, where are we on time? 6.13. All right, I'm trying to make sure that I'm covering a couple of things. Free breakfast, a lot of folks know that was really, really important. I put this in here because I think it's important for folks to see the numbers of how many students this is really affecting according to the um, 2023 um, fiscal year budget. Uh, and it broke it down by county when we think of how many children in schools you know, when they go to school, this is probably one of the only places they get, a, they're able to get a well-balanced meal. And also the governor and um, Dr. Mumin, the secretary of education, did a tour of just kind of explaining that to folks and they included children in the process. And I thought that was amazing. One of the schools, uh, Penn Hills School District was able to participate. They had some of their students um, at a day camp who were able to introduce the governor and um, they were also nervous, but it was so cool to just see kids be involved. They had a little lunch um, uh, tray with a little apple and everything so that they could see like the bill being signed and all that. Um, these are just additional things, especially when we think about other areas that affect a lot of the folks that we may service or assist. When we think of the websites for this um, state, Code Office was created the Commonwealth Office of Digital Experience, really making sure that things are inclusive. We know a lot of the websites definitely need work and need help. So the state is also going through like a revamp process with the website to make sure that um, the links actually work. They have the right information. So it's gonna take a bit of time, but it's a work in progress. Um, a director has been um, designated for that office and also wanted to highlight those um, it was in the prior slide about broadband because we know how important it is for folks to have access to high speed internet. So there is a good bit of money that is being allocated for that um, in, in the budget and just in general. Um, and then last but not least, 
I know I went through this fast, but I just wanted to make sure I stayed on this slide. I think the biggest thing I always try to tell folks, no matter what rooms I'm in, call to action, communicate with your elected officials. It doesn't just mean in Harrisburg, but when you are in your hometown, you know, um, I've had colleagues or just a professor told me that if you are a social worker and your state rep does not know who you are, then you need to change that. They need to understand who you are. You need to understand what committees they serve on, what things that, you know, really affect some of the folks that you work with and reviewing the committees on the websites because um, it's very accessible. And then if you go to PA Ledge, Legis notifications, you can sign up your email and kind of get, you know, those daily notifications of what's going on, what's being voted on, and whether it's like um, a legislator who is trying to make this like October Homeless Children's Month or things like that. All those things come up. Um, okay. And then lastly, this is my community. This is my email, um, our Instagram for the commission, um, and also our Facebook. And then lastly, I'll say a couple of things. We're working on projects that are in the works. We're working on some historical markers. So I've gotten some calls on some historical black cemeteries throughout Pennsylvania that um, were once owned by various parties. Either those groups have um, gone away or people have passed away, things like that. And so um, working on to get like historical markers with the PA Historical um, Commission and seeing what, pro what items that we need for that. I'm working on some uh, coalition building with some folks who are doing work with Black um, youth suicide because we are seeing the numbers increase drastically, especially in a lot of low-income neighborhoods. Um, working on some Black History Month things um, as we work to make sure that we're including art and connecting with the PA Council of Arts to create a whole month of Black history as we um, make sure that we are including all Black artists from across the Commonwealth um, and then women's health policy. So if folks are not aware of period poverty is a really huge um, or period inequity or um, there's a lot of different wordings from that, but we're working with some folks to get a round table together in the spring so that we can continue to put it in the forefront. There have been some other states who have allocated funding or even continue to, like for example, um, I know Florida is not like on the top of our list right now, but that's one of the states that comes to mind that has um, provided funding for K to 12 for funding for period products in schools. And then New Jersey as well has um, some initiatives going on for that. Um, so if you have definitely folks who, um, when you think of all the income uh, spectrum, whichever, that period inequality is an issue, make sure you tell your legislators, they need to hear this from the folks who are doing the work because it's very, very important. Um, and I have some events coming up that I'll probably share that can be disseminated with folks. And so I will stop sharing there. And any questions? I know I said a lot. <laughs> Well, just thank you for for that. And um, like, I I certainly um, prior to connecting prior to Annette being uh, appointed to this role and connecting with with her on a more regular basis, I certainly was not aware myself even of the the, the many roles that the governor's commissions uh, play. So um, thank you for that. And uh, also was able to attend the the Juneteenth event uh, that that uh, that Annette spoke of and um, thought that was a, a really, a really fabulous event. Um, I will note, because uh, you didn't mention it, uh, that uh, Annette does a weekly um, update <laughs> uh, for the, for the commission um, on the email that goes out uh, that has a lot of resources. And I know, Annette, you're pretty much willing to send that to, to anybody, right? <laughs> Yes, and I'll put my email in the chat as well for folks. I know I went through that pretty fast, but if you'd like to be added, um, I'll put my email here. Just let me know you'd like to be added because I do um, have the email that has a lot of resources throughout the state, different initiatives, and also updates going on within the governor's office and the lieutenant governor's office of things that may be happening, whether it's the Safer Communities Tour or other things related to their offices. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. Just getting a lot of uh, thank yous in the in the chat, um, but yeah, if anyone has any questions, feel free to to type those in. 
Um, in the meantime, I wanted to ask Angie and Natalie if you could provide us with kind of the, the lobbyist synopsis of what's been going on in Harrisburg and how that impacts our members. Cool. Um, yes, I'll, I'll kind of piggyback off what Annette had, had, had talked about when she explained the budget impasse and kind of what that means uh, for everyday employees in the Commonwealth um, and people who work for the administration in particular. I think that's something that definitely um, gets underplayed when we talk about having budgets that are late or uh, not implemented for various reasons on time. So um, it, they, there are real life implications for a lot of a lot of people and a lot of organizations. Um, so just kind of quickly, I, I will note that the governor did sign the budget. Um, I believe the date that he signed it was August 4th, I want to say. Um, and then, but it's not a, it's not completely done because if you've ever heard of what we call code bills in Harrisburg, um, those are bills that are usually passed alongside the budget kind of as a big package. The general fund budget gives each line item how much money they have to spend. And then the various code bills um, kind of give the state agencies instructions on how to they direct them on how to spend that money precisely. So those code bills were not passed. Just the general fund budget was done. Um, so the Senate has has put out notice that they are going to return to voting session tomorrow. Uh, that's actually about three weeks ahead of schedule um, to finish their part of the 2023-2024 the budget. Um, they were scheduled to come back in late September, but are returning tomorrow to hold voting session. And they've said that... Um, you know, the work is necessary to finish the implementation legislation that goes along with the budget. So for that reason, they're returning to, um, you know, kind of get that ball rolling. They've said that they're in communication with leaders of the House and they're hopeful that the House will choose to reconvene sooner rather than later. The House is not scheduled to return until September 6th. Um, the reason for that is that there is uh, a vacancy in the House at the moment. Representative Sarah and Amarado Democrat from Allegheny County um, resigned her seat. She's she's campaigning for Allegheny County executive um, it, election in the fall. So she resigned to um, dedicate her attention full time to that. So there is a special election set for September 19th. Um, and there's uh, Democrat Lindsey Powell and Republican Aaron Connolly, Austin Reith, I believe is how you pronounce her last name. Um, those two are running for the 21st legislative dis district seat. Um, we don't expect the House to return before that election is over because as you may recall, there's a one seat majority in the in the Democrats' favor in the House. So technically at the moment, there it's a, it's a tie. So we don't expect to see the um, House gavel back into session until the Democrats have they expect to retain that seat until they till that election is over. So um, at least the Senate is getting the ball rolling with the fiscal code bill. Um, and a little bit more about that, because they haven't passed the fiscal code, which, as I said, provides direction on agencies on how to spend the money that's allocated in the general fund. Several programs remain without funding. Um, the Shapiro administration put out a memo to legislative leaders when the general fund budget was signed and said that money for a bunch of a bunch of specific programs, um, especially some first time programs that have don't have a precedent on how the money is spent, um, including uh, rate increase for EMS, some financial relief for hospitals and other things. Um, he absolutely said there's there's no precedent for how to spend that money. So I'm not going to let state agencies spend that money until the fiscal code is passed. Um, the Senate leadership has said that uh, the EMS and hospital funding in particular are definitely going to be on the agenda for the Senate to tackle when they come back into session tomorrow. So um, that's where we're, that's, that's kind of where we're at with budget. Um, anything in particular else you wanted me to cover, Joanna? Not at this point, but I know we've got a couple of other uh, topic areas coming up that um, we'll I'll probably ask you to, <laughs> to chime in on. 
<laughs> exactly. It's fine. Um, or one of those um, that has kind of touched both of, of what you're talking about is um, House Bill um, 879, I believe, or 849. 49, yes. Okay. That is um, uh, Representative Schlossberg's bill uh, that was dedicated, intended to spend the, the money for um, the 100 million uh, that had been allocated last year. So, um, Sierra, I know you've been dealing with that a little bit more. So, if you can start us off on that topic and then, you know, we'll chime in as we, as we go. Sure. <clears throat> I'll try and uh, keep my uh, comments a little bit brief because I could talk about this all day. Because uh, again, this is sort of what I do during my day job as well. Um, but for those of you who don't know, we uh, the state of Pennsylvania was awarded $100 million to address the behavioral health, the adult behavioral health system here um, in Pennsylvania. I was about to say Philadelphia, but I meant Pennsylvania. And so <clears throat> they created a behavioral health commission that was made up of different professionals. So NASW actually had a representative, Dr. Stephanie, um, from I believe Penn West University was a part of that behavioral health commission, um, as well as they had psychiatrists and other um, sort of professions there. And then also, I believe they had consumers that were also a part of that commission. And so that commission was in charge of sort of um, deciding how are we going to spend this $100 million. And so what the commission did is they actually divided it up into thirds. And so there was like $33 million that was going to workforce development. There was $33 million that was going to sort of public safety. And then I think there was a 31 million that was going to um, sort of service delivery. So cleaning up sort of our service delivery. And then they had like 1 million and 5 million. And I forget those. So AJ and Natalie, if you want to say in your update what those 1 million and 5 million was for, um, I'll leave that for you because I actually forget that off the top of my head. <clears throat> so anyway, that was sort of the outcome of that. And then Rep Slosberg, who has been leading sort of this, had uh, created the bill to sort of get this money into the budget and sort of allocate it to the county so that we can start, you know, essentially addressing our adult, adult behavioral health system here in Pennsylvania. Unfortunately, um, for many reasons out of our control, that did not happen. Um, and so the $100 million, and Angie and Allie, this is where you come into because I want to make sure that I'm communicating this correctly, but I believe the $100 million actually went into the uh, Department of Education, so the school route, rather than coming into the community behavioral health, adult behavioral health side. Yeah, just to clarify, the money in the Senate's version of the general fund budget, the Senate directed that money into school mental health programs. Yes. And so while we understand that there is a need to sort of have uh, mental health services in the school system, um, this was actually very frustrating and devastating for those who are in the adult behavioral health because we sort of need that money. So we have been working on a very skeleton, very survival sort of budget since 2012 when we had our first cut, which was about 10%. And so that was about $86 million that was cut from our budget. And then you sort of look at where we've been going from 2020 or 2012 with inflation, with the cost of living, and then we had the pandemic and sort of all of these different challenges and we're still operating on this budget that has not caught up to where we're currently at. And so this is very frustrating for people. One, the Behavioral Health Commission that was put together sort of uh, was in charge of allocating this, but then also people who are in behavioral health, like myself and most of you that are probably on this call, if you work in the public system, um, it's very frustrating because this was a chance for us to sort of get, even though it was one-time funding, this funding was there to sort of help us sort of in, um, improve our sort of struggling system that we currently have. So as of right now, <clears throat> if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, as of right now, Angie and Natalie, there's not much that we can do to sort of get that money back into the adult behavioral system. And so I believe right now sort of the work that is being done of how to address this for the next budget season. Um, Angie, I saw you unmute yourself, so I just want to make sure I cur cur Yeah, yeah. I I'll just chime in that there was, um, as as you know, Sierra, there was a, a rally at the Capitol last month, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, spearheaded by uh, 
Senator Collette and Representative Schlossberg. And at that time, I think Representative Schlossberg said um, that maybe it would be possible to redirect the funding in a fiscal code bill, um, but not putting out a lot of hope for that. Um, so definitely looking forward to future, how to fix this in the future. Yeah. And so where does NASW sort of sit in this? Where are we sort of at with this? And so we've been involved in this process, again, like I said, from the beginning with having someone sit on the Behavioral Health Commission. Um, I've actually been, we had our own sort of separate bu uh, uh, budget hearing that was put on by our legislative committee. And so that was earlier this summer in June. So we had uh, that as well as um, I participated in Rep Slossberg and Senator Collette's budget press hearing that they also additionally had sort of speaking from not as your president, not as my work, but as a social worker, as someone who has dedicated their life to sort of, you know, the behavioral, working in the behavioral health system. Um, and so that's sort of where we're at right now is making sure that we're sort of being at the table, part of these conversations and uh, being included in making sure that we're up to date on sort of what's happening. Because again, we know that this money is going to have a direct impact on so many social workers in the state of Pennsylvania. When we talk about you know, wages and why we can't get above 42, 45,000 if you're LSW. I think it's like 65,000 currently if you're LCSW in the public system. It's because of our budget. So, understanding as a, a social worker, a micro social worker, that your salary is dependent on what's happening at the state budget. And so, this is why advocacy is so important. And so, leadership within NASW has been looking at sort of what else could we possibly be doing when it comes to education and awareness? So we're meeting with different reps. We're educating them. I can tell you right now, there's so many reps out there that have no idea what it takes to become an LCSW. And so me just starting from the very beginning and just walking them through that. Um, I think one of the funniest questions I've gotten was some, uh, I asked a senator or a rep or a, um, not a senator, I think it was just a, 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 let's just say a representative, how much do you think social workers make? And they said about $80,000. And I was like, um, no, that's not what we're currently at in the public system. So again, I think um, educating sort of our reps uh, around sort of the challenges and barriers that we're facing as social workers, but then also just letting them know, oh, my screen phone, can you still hear me? Yes, we can still hear you. Okay, my screen froze, so I, I'm just going to keep speaking, but if you if I cut out or anything, please just let me know. Um, but sorry, now I lost my train of thought. What was I saying? <laughs> uh, you were explaining the error of their ways in, in guessing the salary. Exactly. So, um, and so we have been looking and talking about different avenues. So again, a lot of the challenges that we're having when we look at the behavioral health system is also having correct data. Um, and so what we know is that Pennsylvania is not really great at collecting data, but this data is sort of necessary to paint the picture or sort of paint the story of sort of what our workforce challenges currently look at. And so NASW, again, being part of some of these conversations and looking at how we can best support, you know, social workers across the state of Pennsylvania. Um, I think that's pretty much it when it comes to the $100 million. Angie, Natalie, or Joanna, is there anything else that I'm missing or that you would like to add? I know um, some folks uh, in the comments were mentioning uh, like the, the need to, to fund mental health at all levels. And that's something that I think um, is probably something that, you know, that we want to address that you know, that absolutely we do agree that there does need to be far more money in the in the school system. Um, but there is kind of this, you know, a, sim a frequent legislative strategy is to pit um, groups in need against each other and like call it a competition of resources when, you know, when it's not necessary, you know, when that's not necessarily what it would have to be. Um, it would have been very easy to, to fund both of those programs at the level that they were suggested, um, especially since the hundred million that we're talking about here came from the um, you know federal government with the Recovery Act and the school mental health funding is intended to be um, recurring funds, but kind of currently at least funded with a non-recurring source. Uh, so that makes things a little bit more more challenging. 
Um, but we're we're definitely very much in favor of um, you know mental health being improved at all of these levels because we see it uh, we see it um, kind of across the board uh, as being under resourced um, in general. Yeah, I would just like to add to um, to say to that that this is a and so we can fund school mental health services and we can fund our adult behavioral health service. So as Joanna mentioned, for those of you who don't know, there's there was sort of um, there was a hundred million dollars that was already allocated to the adult behavioral health, but then there was another hundred million dollars that was advocated to or um, that was for school mental health services. And so what they did is they sort of took the one from adult behavioral health and then put it into school services. So this is not like we have to fund either or, and I'm taking words directly from Rep Salzberg. He was saying that this is possible that we can fund both um, because I want to make it clear that the students of today that are in the school that are experiencing mental health services are going to be our adults of tomorrow. And when we look at the, ad the adult system and we look at some of the challenges and barriers and the gaps of services, this is sort of where they come from. So it's not about funding one or the other. It's about how are we funding all of this because this is sort of a pipeline that we need to address. And because we're addressing it from a silo, sort of um, understanding, then that's why we continue to experiencing uh, a lot of the challenges that we're facing today. Um, definitely one of the things that, you know, may be a takeaway from this town hall. Um, I know Annette spoke about contacting your reps. Uh, Sierra's talking about these conversations with, um, you know, that she's having even with folks who are completely unfamiliar with, you know, like the basics of how to get an LCSW or that sort of thing. Um, it really is important to have these conversations um, with our representatives uh, and senators so that they are familiar with the social work profession, what we do, the issues we face, and uh, the things that we're seeing in the field. Um, so anyone who is looking, I know they were still, um, uh, as of the last time I heard, uh, Representative Schlossberg was still encouraging folks to uh, contact their senators um, about uh, House Bill 849 and see um, whether we could uh, see whether anything could get past the finish line. Um, not sure exactly what that would mean in terms of the finances based on what uh, Sierra and Angie shared earlier, uh, but we can certainly contact our representatives, our, our senators, and uh, let them know that this is an, an area of need. Um, and, uh, oh, yeah, and Sierra, uh, Sierra, I'll let you chime in on that one, the inform your clients. Yeah, um, I, I, so the funny part is, like I said, I do this uh, as my day job. And today we were just talking about um, sort of how to move forward. Um, because when we're going into the room, they're seeing us sort of as professionals. And they're seeing us as you want to do this because you want higher salaries and, you know, um, you want, you know, uh, more flexible schedule and whatever. And those things are true. And we have clients that we serve. And if we are under-resourced and underpaid, we cannot do our jobs fully. And so by informing our clients that we're working with sort of what's happening at the state level and how this impacts them, when they go, they're seeing their constituent. They're not seeing a professional. And so it's very important that when we talk about civic engagement, how are we as social workers being sort of civilly engaged with our clients, informing them what's happening at the state level and how this is having a direct impact on services? So when you know you have clients who are talking about they can't see a psychiatrist for six months or they need a script and they only have a script for 30 days or, or you know um, they have been in and out of like care or they're looking for long-term care, all of these things are impacted by our budget. And so by educating them and informing them on sort of what's happening and taking sort of the politicalness out of it of like Republican and Democrat, but just letting them know like, this is sort of where we're at and this is how this is impacting you and, edu and informing them of sort of how to reach out to their, um, you know, their representatives and sometimes even going with them. Um, there's nothing wrong with, and there's nothing against our code of ethics that says you cannot go with your client and sort of advocate. Um, so really looking at how as social workers we're uh, being more specifically engaged with our clients as well. Great. Um, 
Sarah, did you want to mention that event that uh, we heard about that's coming up soon? Yes. Um, so there, I'm going to get clarification because I just found out there's two events. Um, but on September 27th, there is a sort of a consumer peer led, um, rally that is happening in, um, Harrisburg. And so this is put on by a consumer organization or a peer organization. Um, and they're essentially going to Harrisburg and rally and have different speakers, um, to talk about, you know, how they're being impacted by this budget. Um, so I think what we're going to see, and I'm actually kind of excited about, I think we're going to start seeing more of a vocalization from professionals and from, you know, uh, peers and, um, you know, family members and individuals who are in recovery, sort of getting a little bit more loud in, in their face because, and I talk about this a lot, that, you know, behavioral health workers, not just social workers, but behavioral health workers, we sort of have been this silent profession. And by being a silent profession, we have seen, you know, sort of the devaluation of the services that we do, where everyone believes that anyone can be a so social worker. And we know that everyone cannot be a social worker. Um, and so um, no longer being silent, sort of being out there. And so that's something that we're looking at leadership as well, is how are we sort of offering opportunities for, you know, social workers to sort of be more civically engaged and sort of be louder um, and bring awareness to sort of these challenges that are having a direct impact on us. So this will be, more information will be coming out in the newsletter, I believe. Um, so just keep an eye out on that. Yep, um, and I noted uh, there was a comment in the chat about that we are well-educated professionals and shouldn't have to give reasons as to why we deserve a livable wage, which is which is very true. I think um, workforce uh, and and just social work salaries in general, um, like ben social work licensure, all of these challenges that we that we face as a profession. Um, we absolutely need to, um, you know, ad to continue to advocate for ourselves and to ensure that it's known uh, both what our professional degrees are, the level of education that, that uh, by far most of us have master's degrees and even those with, and those with bachelor's degrees are, you know, have, um, you know, have an incredible amount of field hours prior to graduation, you know, just et cetera, et cetera. Um, and um, the, the, that whole stereotype or, or tradition of social workers being, um, you know, just uh, self-serving or saying that we don't um, or not advocating for ourselves when salary comes to, to play um, definitely is something that needs to that needs to change overall. And that I think our we have a workforce committee who's uh, working on that, and I know uh, we're blessed to have uh, Sierra in the role that she's in uh, coming in with her professional experience in, in workforce. Um, yes, I love the, uh, I love the comments that are coming in. Please do, please do keep them coming. Um, the, one of the next things we wanted to talk about uh, just to provide an update and then we'll open up it in general for questions. Um, I have a couple of random things I can ask about if we don't have questions, but uh, we'd love to we'd love to hear from you too. Um, and that is to update everyone on uh, the social work comp li uh, licensure compact and kind of where we are in, in the Commonwealth um, and going to ask I'm going to ask Angie and Natalie to chime in a, a couple of times there too. Um, so the social work compact, um, I know we've discussed in general at a previous town hall and you know newsletters, et cetera, uh, but would make it possible for social workers who are licensed in one state to practice in any of the other states to participate in the compact. Uh, there are, are things like that that exist now, uh, such as a nursing compact. Uh, there's a, psych, a, a compact for psychologists, um, several of those. Um, and the social work, we, we'd actually gotten some questions a long time ago that's like when the, when, the psycholo when the psychological compact was coming up, they'd be like, well, why, why can't we join a compact here? And I'd be like, well, there's no compact for us to join. Well, 
Well, now there is. Um, there is a compact, um, although it's still a very in the early stages. It has to have at least seven states pass it in order for um, in order for uh, it to come into fruition. Only one state has thus far. That's Missouri, um, and for the majority of states. Uh, their legislative cycles have ended at this point in the year, and they'll be starting anew. Uh, Pennsylvania is one of only a handful of states that has, um, you know, full year or, in our case, two-year legislative session. Um, we had not uh, started our bill yet, in part be primarily because of the issue that um, it relates to background checks. Uh, with um, in the Commonwealth that thus far has prevented, even though the state legislature has passed and the governor has signed several compacts, people who join them, in, like people in Pennsylvania, still aren't able to join those compacts, even though the Commonwealth may have passed those bills several years in the past. Um, because of like a separate issue. And here I'm going to pass it over to Angie for a little bit to help explain that in the most, uh, yeah, and the most a little bit clearer than I can. <laughs> possible, right. There's an issue with FBI background checks and the way that the uh, FBI gets authorization from states to give those background checks to like a third party entity, like like the the body that oversees a compact. So um, Pennsylvania is just a handful of states that have have not yet come to been able to come to agreement with the state police and the administration and the FBI on um, how to do that. So I think the Shapiro administration, once they came in, once they came, you know into office and got up to speed on this. I know legislative staff have been working on this for years and have been trying to um, you know, solve this problem. Um, the administration is now actively engaged. Uh, Commissioner Schmidt said, Department of State, I'm uh, sorry, not Commissioner, Department of State Secretary Al Schmidt said, um, was quoted in a press release just recently, it said um, that among preconditions for fully implementing a compact, um, you have to have performed an FBI background check on Pennsylvania applicants, a process that requires FBI authorization. The Department of State has sought this authorization and is awaiting a response from the FBI. And um, Schmidt's quote is that we are ensuring other technical and regulatory requirements are able to be met so the Commonwealth can fully implement compacts as soon as possible once we receive FBI support. So it does finally look like that that ball is rolling and, um, you know, we do hope that that issue will be resolved sooner rather than later. Now, there is also a federal piece of legislation uh, called the SHARE Act. Um, NASW National is like reviewing that to see whether they can, you know, whether they'll be taking a, an official position on the SHARE Act. Uh, but so for now, I can't say like go support it. But um, I can tell you that it exists and that, well, the purpose behind it is to resolve these issues for um, all of the states that are that are impacted. Uh, Pennsylvania is also, I learned um, from working with the um, the CSG, which is the um, like the Commission Council for State Governments. Council for State Governments. OK, um, that uh, that 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 has been. Um, Supporting um, this initiative, uh, along with the Department of Defense, um, you know, in, which gets involved because of uh, like military spouses and military, you know, military members um, needing to to be licensed in multiple venues uh, and able to facilitate um, transportation and you know and troop deployment. Um, so, uh, yeah, but the CSG uh, informed me that even though there are a handful of states that are impacted by this, that many of them are impacted for certain uh, certain compacts and not for others, and that Pennsylvania is really the only state that is across the board impacted by by this issue. So, um, you know, so we always love to be unique in Pennsylvania. <laughs> um, but uh, that's uh, but 
anyway, so long, long run is, um, however, there, that doesn't mean the fact that this issue is exists doesn't necessarily mean that we shouldn't be working to get, um, you know, to get the ball rolling in Pennsylvania. Um, for one thing, as I mentioned, you know, only one state has passed this so far and the, and the um, commission uh, for the compact won't even exist until seven states have passed it. Um, so it's at least like a minimum of 18 months to two years away from, from being at the stage where anyone could theoretically join the compact, um, even if it existed. Um, and, you know, and, and of course it may take some time for, you know, for it to get past, um, you know, past the legislature in, in Pennsylvania. So we are, um, we've been working on this as a legislative strategy for some time, kind of wanting to make sure we were crossing all of our uh, T's and dotting our I's to ensure we were going um, in the way that was going to best facilitate for passage. Um, however, we are looking now at um, at uh, looking. We are looking now at uh, getting a bill started in the House. Uh, we're going to be having meetings on that very soon. So just that's just to provide the quick update. Once we get to that stage where we actually have um, you know a sponsor and are ready to launch the bill, that's going to be another really important time for advocacy because at that point there will be um, you know an opportunity for any legislator um, in the House, uh, I think is where we're looking at focusing, but there'll be an opportunity for any House member to sign on as a co-sponsor. And the larger number of co-sponsors that we have, um, the more bipartisan our efforts are as far as collecting co-sponsors, the more likely it is that the, that the bill will, will see movement and will pass. So that will definitely be, uh, that's definitely one to watch for, because when we get to that stage, we're going to be like, if you can, please uh, have meetings with your, with your reps. Um, and those of you who have close relationships with your, um, with the members of, uh, with your representatives, uh, definitely will be asking you to see if your, if your representatives can, can sign on. Um, so that's a quick update about the, um, the compact. Uh, Sierra, was there anything you wanted to add about that? Nope, I think you sort of hit everything. <laughs> Good deal. <laughs> um, Andy, and uh, are you uh, able to share a little bit about anything about um, kind of the atmosphere that we're looking at going into uh, uh, looking at compacts? Um, sure. Um, yeah, I can share that. Um, we've talked this over, you know, with, with House and Senate staff earlier in this session, as soon as the national compact language kind of became available, right? Um, and at that time, got pretty clear direction from staff that, um, especially in the Senate, which is kind of where we thought maybe we would originally start with a bill there, um, that there really wasn't any appetite by the chairman at that time to move any bills on compacts until this FBI issue was cleared up. Um, and that was early days of the Shapiro administration. And I think the, the word we got at that time was that the administration, the administration had been briefed um, and we were hopeful that they would get engaged and kind of lead the charge on fixing this. So um, I think as, as the months wore on and, and, you know, we've got an incredibly, um, you know, forward thinking secretary of state in Al Schmidt, I think that, um, you know, they've looked at ways that they can speed license and, and the Shapiro administration too. I mean, if that directive comes from the top to make everything as efficient as possible with, uh, around, um, you know, licensing and regulations. So um, I think that this really did rise to the attention to the very top to say, this is crazy that we have enacted so many compacts and, you know, in many instances, members can't participate because of this technical issue. So um, I, I think we started seeing it move a lot more quickly. And we've seen a number of bills be introduced in, um, by, by House Democrats, um, you know, for various other compacts that as yours has kind of come about in the past year or so, so have many other professions. Um, so 
we're exploring now, um, is there going to be any plan by the house to kind of move those forward, like in a big group and at least get some forward momentum while we wait to see that this, that this kind of national issue gets worked out, um, then maybe we'll have this package of bills that'll be ready to go once that's ready. So that's a little bit of kind of how our thinking has evolved on it just over the past eight months here. For sure. Um, yeah, and we've, in the meantime, we've been having a lot of uh, meetings with elected officials, uh, like we had a whole bunch of new uh, reps and senators come in um, at uh, in January, and uh, we've been having a lot of like meet and greets. Um, there, there's only one social worker currently in the, the House of Representatives, that's Representative Arianne Abney. If you were here and participated in any of our Legislative Advocacy Day events back in March, then you had the opportunity to hear from uh, Rep Representative Abney a lot more at the time. Um, but there's a lot of um, representatives, uh, including those ones who were recently elected, who have a lot of experience um, talking with social workers, whether that be um, social work um, spouses, uh, like being working in an emergency room uh, with social workers uh, as a physician or uh, in, like a, or an emergency room nurse, um, those who um, those who like have mental health issues themselves and are very strong mental health advocates and uh you know are familiar with with social workers that way so we found a, a lot of very friendly ears as we've been having these meetings and working on forming these these relationships um any is there uh, like i i'm like Skimming through the the chat to see if there's any question uh, any questions. I'm seeing a lot of good comments, but um, if you if you do have a question about the compact, about um, well about the the hundred million dollar funding or anything else we've talked about thus far, you're welcome to type it in. You're also welcome to unmute. We'd love to to hear from you, or you can ask us about other legislative issues. Um, even if we're not familiar with them, though, though we can at least mark them down to, to look into. I noted, um, oh yes, as somebody commented in the chat that it's taking 10 weeks to approve their application just for permission to take the exam. Um, and that it that from her perspective, it doesn't feel like they're focused on on efficiency. Ah, Sierra, uh, you can and maybe address that one a little bit. It asks um, about the upcoming conference. Uh, okay, so I see. Uh, yeah, I'll address that one. There's also there's one under it, and I just want to. What other states are lying um, to find the to found the compact? Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of folks who are trying to get that passed. Um, it's uh, it, it's definitely a broad it kind of throw, uh, everybody's trying to get it passed. It's just a question of who's going to you know who's going to get it uh, first and who's able to get it through their license their uh, their board. Um, I know Missouri was first. Um, there's a website. Um, Sierra, if you want to answer that other question, I will work on pulling up that website and can share the photo the, of like the state map of where that's kind of going. Okay. Um, before, I, again, before I talk about the conference, there's another question. Um, it says, but what about public related university funding? Um, I'm actually going to need you to come off of mute and, uh, and kind of clarify because that can mean several different things. I want to make sure that I'm addressing um, the, question, the question correctly. So Cindy, if you could either clarify in the chat or come off of mute and clarify your question. Well, I'm talking about Pitt, Penn State, and Temple not getting the state funding yet for this year, and school has started. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. So there's people in social work school that, you know, what's the tuition going to be every year, every year this happens and it gets dragged out more and more and it's getting more and more political as far as the funding. And, and it, it just seems like it, it should be settled before September, October, November. Yeah. So I'm uh, Angie, I see you unmuted yourself. So I am going to pass it to you because the, only yeah. Yeah. And I will just doing... chime in. Yeah, you're correct. It is not settled. And this is, I, I think the longest we've ever seen it go. Um, and the kind of the most divided we've ever seen <sighs> these votes kind of failed over and over again. Um, as they tried to, as you're probably well aware, they tried many times, over the few day, the last few days of session in July, when they were here um, voting on the budget, um, the House really was just not able to um, get the majority needed to uh, to pass those bills. So that's still a big question mark. I haven't heard if that's if those bills will be taken up. And again, um, you know, the the issue was was in the House, and the House isn't slated to come back till the end of September. Yeah, I also heard that there was a connection there with um, folks objecting to certain universities because of um, because mm -hmm. of gender affirming care. There were all sorts of reasons given. Um, you know, the yes, <laughs> that mm -hmm. that was that that came up. Um, the the Freedom Caucus made that a talking point. Um, other other complaints were made about um you know their, them being exempt from right to know requests which has been kind of a, a a ongoing talking point over the past few years so um but yeah sadly still uh still really no answers on when that's going to happen okay i put up i found the map uh that talks about where legislation is actively pending right now um, I believe this does not include some of the spots where, um, you know, like if uh, if their legislative cycle is already ended and closed. I, I'm not sure what that means as far as like whether the color would have been changed or not. Um, I think it. I think if they got a bill in, it's here on this. It's here on this map as uh, as far as uh, labeled as pending. Um, so that would be Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, New Jersey, Ohio, uh, and Wisconsin, in addition to Missouri. Um, I think, I believe I heard that Ohio is actually relatively close to passage, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and that, um, that was like a separate um, bill, but I think they made, I think they passed one house uh and are are waiting on the other and are waiting on the other chamber now but they're the only other ones that i know of that have gotten that have gotten that far so um like i said we probably have some a little bit of time before this comes into before this comes into law um but we're uh we had been holding out not because we weren't interested in the bill but um on, but uh, only because we were trying to figure out the best strategy for how to how to get it passed um and uh and, and I know Angie earlier described kind of our evolving evolving thinking on on that matter share all right Siri you want to talk about the conference yeah, uh, but before I do that, sorry, <laughs> there's like two <laughs> comments. Um, so there's a comment um, from John and uh, Jonathan. And Jonathan, I would love for you to email me. So I'm going to put this in there because I think what you're uh, speaking to deserves a larger conversation. Um, and uh, as an ASW, I don't know sort of if we've done any work around harm reduction um, as of yet, but I would love to sort of hear your thoughts um, and sort of have that conversation more. So I will, uh, well, actually my email's on the website. So just email, I think it's president at naswpa.org. Um, Thank you. Yes. 
And then um, there's another comment in here. Um, Elizabeth as well, same thing, if you can email me, because I think this again is part of a sort of a larger conversation and we did not um, sort of account for some of these conversations tonight. So if you wouldn't mind emailing me um, and then that way we can sort of continue the conversation um, off of here as well. Um, and same thing for um, Elizabeth uh, as well to sort of email me. Um, all right, so again, because I wanna be aware of everyone's time, um, I would like to talk about the conference. Um, so I'm very, very excited this year uh, because again, this is my first conference as your official president. Um, and so as of right now, the um, registration, everything is open, so everything is live. I went on to NASW this morning and took a quick look. Um, so everything is up and everything is working. <laughs> um, so we're very excited for this year's conference because we listened. And we took into account a lot of what we heard um, at the conference uh, last year, but then also the conferences before and sort of the feedback. And so um, the conference may look a little different this year, but that's for good reason. So some things may be a little trial and error and some things may be um, in response to some of the feedback that we have gotten. Um, so again, um, the registration is open. It is on the website. So some just key points to um, uh, mention. So Sunday, we will have a couple of events um, that is open. They're sort of like pre-conference events to sort of get everyone um, engaged and excited. Um, so one of those is a cookie, cookie decorating class. Um, so we'll be able to sort of decorate cookies and then obviously eat them afterwards. So who doesn't love cookies? Uh, the other one is we have a ropes course, and that will actually be run by our former president, uh, Christy, Christy Joe. And so she's excited to sort of be there with um, members. And then the third one is, and I always forget this one, so cookie, ropes course, and oh, so um, Becky, um, who's also a long-term NASW member, um, she has put something together for uh, at the water park. And so there's three different events. So one is cookie decorating, one's at the water park, and then the last one is the uh, ropes course. And so all of those is happening sort of on Sunday as a pre-event. Um, we have um, some great keynote speakers uh, this year, so I'm very excited about that as well. Um, so one of our keynote speakers is the uh, new CEO, so Dr. Anthony Eastry. Um, and we just found out that he's actually going to be at our conference um, pretty much the entire time. So that's pretty good. So you'll be able to meet him. And he's someone, again, um, Dr. Street and I, we sat on the national board together. So that's where I sort of first met him. Um, he's very open. He's very engaging and he loves to hear from members. Um, so if you do see him, don't be shy and just go up to him and introduce yourself. And, you know, if you can have a brief conversation with him Um the, and then, of course, we have Annette Nance, who's also going to be our keynote speaker uh, during the PACE luncheon. So very excited about that. Um, one of the things that we also are doing that this was literally just confirmed last night, but we are sort of having a panel um, during the after uh, Annette's um, keynote. Um, and so this panel is going to be sort of uh, geared towards how to get social workers politically involved. And so I think uh, for those of you who know me and for those of you who don't, um, advocacy is sort of one of my passions and getting social workers sort of aware and more politically involved has been sort of a goal of mine. Um, and so this year we're looking at having a panel um, of, you know, different social workers um, my hope is to sort of have like a someone who ran for school board is currently a school board member, um, you know, having a student who has done some great work too. So really sort of diversifying, um, you know, how to get social workers involved because not everyone wants to run for office, not everyone wants to be elected officials, but there are some things that we can be doing as social workers to be more civically engaged. Um, then our last keynote is Lee Westgate. Um, I'm very excited to um, hear from Lee because I have heard uh, great things about them. And so, uh, but I've never seen them speak. And so I'm very, very excited about having Lee Westgate come as well. Um, one of the other additions that we have is um, a sort of a self-care sort of break. So we know that conferences is a lot. We're going to sort of session after session after session, taking all of that information in. Um, and so this year in partnership with, is it um, Slippery Rock, Joanna? University, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, 
Slippery Rock University. Um, so they sort of have like a self-care zone that you'll be able to go and sort of take a break. Um, so they have different activities that you'll be able to do, or you can just go and sit and sort of take that breather in between sessions if you would like. Um, the other addition, so again, we also have our gala every single year. So our nominations are open for awards. So I always believe that social workers should be celebrated. And so if you know a social worker that should be celebrated, please consider um, filling out the nominations for awards that we have. All of this information, again, can be found on the website. Um, but if you, for some reason, cannot find it, again, email myself or Joanna, and we would direct you. Uh, towards the nomination. Um, those awards may be given out at our gala. And so I would always say, I always like to talk about the gala. It's pretty nice. You get a chance to, you know, get dressed up and, you know, um, hear about the different awardees. So if you do have an interest in that, um, I would encourage you to sort of, um, you know, uh, think about attending that. And this year too, we, uh, so for those of you, well, I think most social workers know, but um, we, Ms. Joyner, Joyner passed earlier or actually, yeah, earlier this summer. Um, and so we are doing a memorial in her honor. Um, and Joanna, when is, it's Monday night, Tuesday night? Tuesday. Tuesday night. So it is Tuesday night. Um, and so we will have a memorial as well as we are also, um, creating a new award that's going to be sort of the Mitt Joyner um, Social Justice Award. Joanna, is that the name that we decided on? <laughs> so yeah. the Social Justice Award as well. Um, and so again, that information will be coming uh, soon as well. So I believe those are like most of the major updates. But if you, again, if you have any questions, uh, let me know. And okay, so we will get more. I see a comment in here about more information about the memorial. So maybe we should, Joanna, consider thinking about putting something up about for members about that separately. Um, so I'm coming into the chat. Will there be a virtual option for those who cannot attend in person? No, there is no virtual component this year. Um, again, listening to feedback from last year yes. and the year before. Um, this yeah, is I, I can jump in on that one if you want, Sierra. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so listening from feedback from that year, just with a lot of the sort of difficulties, technical difficulties that we had um, with sound and, you know, visuals and stuff, we decided to go uh, back into person this year. Yeah, we also have, um, we do plan uh, long term on having some form of virtual like attendance, um, but we're looking at the different models for how that might work. Um, this isn't again for this year. This year we have very brand new staff um, for the, if you uh, are aware, um, Michelle Broad uh, joined us on staff uh, only like two weeks before last year's conference. Um, and then after I came down with COVID in the middle of the conference and got sidelined, she had to kind of take over um, right, uh, right, right when she was a new employee with the assistance of uh, Sierra and Christy jumping in as volunteers and, and of course all of our staff. Um, I, I, I like Alicia and, um, and Rachel were all and our multiple interns at the time were all uh, jumping in as much as they could. Um, but uh, for this year, kind of acknowledging, knowing that we have new staff, we definitely want to, you know, keep it uh, simple while our staff are learning the ropes and getting and getting trained for our new employees. Uh, but we do intend on having that as an as a aspect of of future conferences. Um, we're just. Uh, Again, re-looking at the model and giving our staff a chance to, to learn the rope. Yeah. Um, so I did want to address, there's a comment, is the event mass friendly for those caring for elderly relatives? So we are, um, actually, Joanne, I'll let you answer this one. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, oh, is the event mass friendly for those caring for el elderly relatives? Uh, we certainly will. Um, allow anyone who uh, like anyone who wants to wear a mask is encouraged to do so. Um, we also will have uh, the kind of color coded neckbands that we had last time that uh, kind of give some indication uh, whether you feel comfortable with attend, you know, whether you feel comfortable being close to others or not. 
um, yellow kind of meant um, like I'm kind of comfortable, like fist bump or whatever, but you know, no, uh, like no, no real handshakes or, or whatever. And then red was definitely the, I don't feel comfortable. Uh, so please stay, please stay six feet away. Um, so those, those will be available again. Uh, we're working on kind of ordering through all of that right now. Um, also, uh, we have, a. a accommodations posted on our on our website when you go register that and you know that gives a lot of information about like uh accommodations for people with mobility issues food out food sensitivity or allergies or anyone else who needs um who needs accommodations um cynthia i see your you have, you have your hand raised <laughs> Yes, thank you. Um, I have a bit of a cold, so I'm not going to put my screen on. But I just want to be on record again that, you know, we have the conference in a place where persons with a disability like myself cannot independently get there. And now we don't have a virtual option. So I just think it is disrespectful all the way around. For those who don't know me, I'm a past president have since been diagnosed with MS and I just don't understand how social workers do this. So I'm not going to be Cynthia, you cut out? Um, yeah, my, I oh, went yeah, out. I'm go. sorry. <laughs> I'm on my phone. But okay. I, just, I just think it's wrong and that's all I have to say. I can't believe it. And I'm extremely upset about it. So that's it. Thank you for your comment, Cynthia. All right. Um, I think that's all the sort of updates that we have for um, tonight. Uh, all right. So I'm just going to say, so we, as of right now, cannot switch our hotels. Um, if I'm being fully honest and being fully transparent, um, this sort of um, agreement that we have with the Kalahari was set in place before I was taken into, before I was elected. Um, Joey and I think- Absolutely. You know, so unfortunately we're in a position where we're kind of contracted to, you know, kind of contracted with the Kalahari until I believe 2026. Joanna? Yeah. Um, and we had to extend it a little bit further than we'd even initially had contracted because of the cancellations due to COVID. Yeah. And we should have a virtual option. That's all I'm saying. It's inexcusable. I know we're contracted. I understand all of that. Then we need a virtual option. Absolutely. Um, and we are working on sort of that virtual option, but because of, again, the feedback that we had from last year, and the with a sort of our budget and trying to figure everything's out and sort of what Joanna just mentioned, it just was not feasible this year. It does not mean that we're not going to have a virtual option moving forward. Heidi. Hi, everybody. I was just wondering, I understand the dynamics of contracts. However, isn't there something in the contract with the Kalahari where there can, if you, if you, you can't do virtual, that the Kalahari can uh, create some kind of accommodation for people um, who need accommodation in some way? Is there any, has that been explored in, in any way? Um, well, not, I mean, there's nothing that would make them create a virtual option. Uh, we certainly do. They, they have, um, they have scooters available for people. Uh, we also have a block of rooms that are um, held for folks who need rooms closer to the side of the conference center um, that will make it available for uh, for anyone who is, you know, who is reliant on, uh, you know, who is reliant on having that closeness in order to be able to get around the conference. Uh, we also have, um, you know, we'll we'll have ramps accessibility uh, through, you know, for our stages and throughout uh, for every event at the conference. Um, they also give offer free valet parking. 
um, and there's other accommodations that we can definitely make for people who um, make it to the Kalahari. I know uh, Cynthia's question has more to do with like transportation to the Kalahari, uh, but we have quite a few um, uh, accommodations for the uh, once once you get there, uh, we can. Um, there's there's all kinds of options that we have for the people who need them. And uh, certainly we're willing, even if there's nothing like known that we that we would have set up, uh, that's one of those things that when they re that when folks register, they just need to let us know what their accessibility needs are. Um, and for example, like, you know, the Kalahari is not gonna pay for a sign language interpreter, but if we have somebody who, um, you know, if we have somebody who needs one, then that service is one that would be provided. Thank you. Uh, Damali. Hello, good evening. Um, yes, yeah, so, and along with that, um, I understand regarding the hiccups and everything with the um, AV in terms of doing the virtual and in person. But I also like to highlight that a lot of the organizations now are changing their PTO time. Like there is no vacation time and personal time. It's all just one PTO. And uh, also a lot of organizations, especially nonprofits uh, or any other organizations, they're not allowing uh, conference time um, for you to take. So if you do take go out for a conference, you have to take it on your own vacation time, which impedes a lot of people as well. So I just would like to have Pennsylvania think about that in the future because like I would love to go in the conference and I would love to be there in person, but then I had to take off five days or four days vacation. And then if I go to two conferences, then I have no time for myself or sick time. So just in the future, if that could be sort of a consideration, maybe not every session, but maybe like key sessions, because then that will allow us to take our CEUs as well and sort of be in the community of our NSAW chapter versus me trying to get CEUs, trying to scramble someplace else just to keep up the licensure where I had to pay like 60 to $200 for a three minute class or, you know, when I could just do a whole conference or a block of classes with my NSAW community. So just to have that consideration in the future that a lot of the organizations are changing. Um, so we may not, even though we do wanna be there, we may not be able to do to circumstances. Yep, I appreciate that feedback um, because that again was some feedback that we got from others, uh, especially with our conference sort of being during the week. Um, so again, our conference days with Kalahari is sort of set in place. But once that contract is over, a lot of these conversations that we're having will be taken into place. And we are looking at sort of, um, you know, having a, a rolling conference will be different parts of the state throughout. So then that way we're making sure that, you know, for those of you that are out on, you know, the Pittsburgh and Erie side, um, we know how difficult it is to sort of get to other areas. Um, so really looking at sort of how are we uh, being accessible, but also changing the venue so that um, that social workers have more access to the conference as well. All right. Thank you. Another thing to, to keep in mind uh, that we, um, you know, that social workers uh, in need, we do offer a lot of, we're looking at uh, adding more uh, virtual, virtual only symposia and events um, to our, you know, to our general programming, um, which is, which may be how we kind of handle things in the long term with that too, is having like a mix, of, having far more of a mix of virtual virtual only uh, events along with, um, you know, in-person events. Um, we also, uh, even now currently, um, in addition to some of those long-term, like longer full day symposia online that we might, that we may be having in the future, currently you're able to get, um, like you participate in our monthly member webinar once a month, uh, which would get you 11 CEs a year along with participating in our quarterly town hall meetings, uh, which gets which would net up to another six CEs per year. Um, so definitely by being a member of NASW PA, uh, you know, a, a person would be able to get um, all 30 of their CE hours 
um, for free as part of their NASW membership. Um, the conference as a whole, we think of it more in terms of like, yes, it's a place for continuing education, but it's also a place for networking, relaxation, um, the ability to connect with, with peers and colleagues. And some of those things just can't be um, duplicated on the, um, you know, on a, a virtual platform. Um, but uh, that does. But as I, as I, as I said, um, it's really just a question of like what we're doing this year. Next year is going to look. Next year is going to look very different. Um, and again, we continue to, yeah, as folks do have interests in like, um, you know, like a full day symposia. Um, you know, please let us know, uh, um, you know, because we're, we're always interested in hearing the feedback of things that, that, that may be of interest. Um, one of the, uh, I did want to mention, uh, while in our last five minutes, uh, along with um, the application for uh, our awards, uh, which again, we offer Social Worker of the Year, uh, we offer a, um, uh, uh, the Chris Kirsten Bowser Young, uh, no, sorry, Emerging Social Work Leader for somebody who's new to the field, uh, Social Work Educator, Public Citizen, the new Mitt Joyner Social Justice Award, um, and our uh, Phyllis Black Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, so uh, nominations are open for all of those. Uh, the other thing that is a new program that applications are open for, and if any of you are eligible, you know, you'd be welcome to apply, but um, for anyone else, uh, if you know of uh, students um, who, who would be eligible, uh, then we, um, you know, would certainly appreciate you getting the word to them. Uh, but we have a new program called Delta Scholar Program uh, that does provide uh, one year of free NASW mem membership, uh, in addition to free conference registration, uh, lead registration, other event registration, along with providing mentorship opportunities for connecting with someone from our board. Um, that is uh, going to be awarded to 10 uh, social work students who um, represent some kind of underserved population within social work. Uh, that is uh, anyone who is of, um, that relates to racial or ethnic minorities, relates to anyone who falls under the LGBTQIA umbrella, uh, folks from rural populations, or folks with physical or mental disabilities. Uh, so um, that is a, a program that we currently are accepting applications for. So and we appreciate anything that, that y'all can do to, to spread the word and make sure that this is getting to the ear of the people that, that reach it. Um, since we were talking about conference registration, I also wanted to mention uh, that we do have a scholarship fund associated for conference registration and that, um, that uh, when you register for your conference, you'll have the opportunity to uh, contribute to that scholarship fund and help bring others who are currently, um, you know, un or underemployed or in some kind of financial need uh, to the conference. Um, any closing words from any of our speakers? I know this last part was a little bit more NASW oriented. So um, here I'll probably throw it to you for most of our closing thoughts, but any of our other speakers are re ready to chime in. Oh, yes. And I see the, the comment about the voting initiative. Uh, yeah. So you may, probably may want to address that too. So, um, yes, we, again, like I said, advocacy and civic engagement is sort of my passion. Um, and so I'm currently working with the PACE chair um, to um, sort of, they because they already had some things created in the past, but I'm not sure what happened with them, but sort of bringing those back out, as well as Joanna and I have also been talking about some of these initiatives and being more visible um, as a chapter. So yes, we will definitely, um, like I said, keep an eye out because there are going to be some major things coming out, um, especially early next year. Um, so keep your eye out for some of these um, initiatives that will be coming out. 
Um, um, and that actually, sorry, before you get into closing remarks, that actually like reminded me of something that I wanted to ask uh, Angie about, um, but uh, wasn't sure. Uh, like, so hopefully I'm not throwing you on the spot too much, Angie. And I know we only have like one minute left, um, but I heard um, on a podcast I was listening to today about the importance of the Supreme Court election that's coming up this November in uh, Pennsylvania and wanted to know if you had any, could tell us a little bit about what's going on there. I cannot. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> I too have, have seen a lot of, I've seen a lot of news and I've seen a lot of people talking about it. I know that the chatter has kind of picked up online this week. Um, and I even made a mental note to myself. I'm like, ah, I need to do a little deeper dive and make sure I fully understand, um, like you said, the Maybe implications the of the court. So uh, I don't, but I'd be more than happy to put a little blurb together if, if that would be helpful in the next few days. Yes. Um, and it, uh, I say your thinking completely aligns with my thinking where I heard about that and was like, all right, this is something I need to know more about. Um, because if it's reaching uh, the level of being on national podcasts, it's probably <laughs> relatively important. Um, but it definitely uh, is. I just <laughs> back to school is kind of. Mm -hmm. So I, will, I will do what I need to do and Angie will do the same to learn more about this, but it's just a, a reminder for those who were asking about the 2024 election that there's a 2023 election too, and that one might also be pretty important. Mm -hmm. All right, Sarah, back to you. Uh, just there was one question about the Delta Scholars. Are the are applications still being accepted? And yes, that is the answer. So I'm going to keep it short and sweet because it is 731 and I'm very aware of everyone's time. I appreciate all of you for coming tonight. Um, as I said, if you have any questions or comments, my email is open. Uh, please feel free to email me. Um, just give me 36 hours to respond. Um, so I always tell people that ahead of time. Um, but again, like I said, I appreciate all, all of you for coming. I hope to see most of you at the conference and I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. All right. Thank you very much.